All right, I have a great show for you today. We're going to be going through some of the biggest stories in the news right now, as well as what's going on with Israel, the Biden administration, the rise of Donald Trump. To help me better understand that, I have with me Dr. Gary Gindler. Dr. Gindler, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for inviting me, Stephen. So uh, you you recently recommended an article on your Twitter feed from Epic Times that the deep state is preparing for another Donald Trump presidency. Do you believe this is true or are they going to do everything they can to keep him away from the White House? Yes, they try everything and anything they could find on him to prevent his relocation from the, the uh, Trump estate in Florida back to the White House. However, you can see the signs that they are preparing for the inevitable. Let's recall their calls for the Supreme Court Justice, Sonia Sotomayor, to resign. And the reason is, She's very sick. So they want her to resign so Biden can appoint friendly to the Democrats Supreme Court justice. If she will not resign and something happened to her, if she passes away when, when Trump will be in the White House, Trump will be able to appoint yet another Supreme Court justice, bringing the total to four, which is kind of life and death situation for the, for the left. They cannot tolerate that. There are other signs when left is slowly but surely preparing the, uh, the background for the move of Trump into the White House. And one of them is Schedule F. You had nice discussion uh, about the Schedule F uh, just a couple of days ago. And it was second time in that day when I learned about Schedule F because the inner workings of the Washington bureaucracy, it's, it's, a, it's, it's hidden from us. <laughs> but Schedule F is very important. And President Biden, uh, in January, uh, when he moved to White House, he canceled all these Schedule F modifications by President Trump. Now, they are making sure that the new president will not be able to fire federal employees, which is one of the methods they use to sabotage all Trump innovations back then during his first four years. So there are other signs when they are trying to mitigate the, the inevitable. And uh, one of the additional ones was all of a sudden New York, which is a sanctuary city within sanctuary state, um, decided not to accept more illegal immigrants because they are uh, at capacity. Maybe number of illegal immigrants in New York City exceeds its physical capacity. And probably it is, because all these five-star hotels in New York City, you cannot find a room. You cannot. Well, maybe some presidential rooms running uh, tens of thousands of dollars per, right, per, per night still available, but all other rooms not available. They are used to host illegal immigrants. And situation from the point of view of Democrats, could, could be uh, uh, a boiling point, could be reaching a boiling point when inflation will trigger massive exodus of the young waters from the Democrat Party. Yeah, and I want to I want to get deeper into that. Um, but I didn't I guess I didn't realize that uh, Justice Sotomayor was sick. I knew that they wanted to replace her. I knew that at the same time, they're also doing this study on whether they should increase the Supreme Court bench to 13. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, they're just, they don't even hide the fact that they are so angry that Trump put so many conservative judges on the bench and they'll do anything they can to try to control the Supreme Court, probably so that they can bring back abortion, 
and some of the other radical ideas that they have. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, Supreme Justice Sotomayor has a very serious case of diabetes, and it's not curable, unfortunately. Uh, she might uh, live for another several months, maybe years, but for, for Democrats, such reality is not acceptable. They cannot tolerate that. Yeah. So they are forcing one of theirs to resign to pave the way to, to change the balance of the Supreme Court. Yeah. One way or not. So uh, we, we started off by me asking, is, is the deep state going to allow Trump uh, to, to get anywhere near that? I, I saw a hit piece against Trump uh, in the Daily Mail just this morning. It said, yes, more and more it's looking like Trump will get back in the White House, but the majority of Americans are terrified he'll never leave again. And that in 2029, because of his ego, he will refuse to give up power and, and try to make himself the king. Is there, is there any truth to this or is this just a hit piece? No, 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 of course it's a hit piece. And number of these hit pieces will increase uh, exponentially after the uh, uh, Re Republican Party convention in August, uh, in July this year. And they will increase exponentially. They cannot tolerate that. For them, again, like for many uh, uh, foreign adversaries, it's life and death situation. Such countries like China, Iran, and many others like Venezuela, they know uh, it's practically death sentence for them. Because Trump will not seek re-election after the second term in White House. That means he will ignore their screams, their childish, you know, or, or screams everywhere. He will just ignore it. He will do what he promised to do. And I hope uh, it will be no other pandemics or scandemic or pandemic, as they call it. Uh, I hope so. They are capable of doing a lot of bad stuff. They openly discussed physical elimination of Trump. And statistics, as you know, is against Trump. Uh, in the United States, there are four uh, assassinations of the, of the president. So three of them were Republicans and only one Democrat. Well, one Democrat, JFK, uh, by modern standards, by the standards of 2024, would be a conservative. A Republican. So statistics is against any Republican, any conservative. Uh, Democrats are capable of doing that, unfortunately. They, they probably will able to find a lot of people willing to pull the trigger, unfortunately. Um, speaking of pulling the trigger, uh, the Biden administration seems to not be able to make a decision on how they feel about Israel and Gaza. On the one hand, they say uh, Israel has the right to defend itself um, and we're going to give you monies and money and weapons. On the other hand, they're funding the other side of the war. They're sending in supplies and, and food to the people that they then say Israel has the right to kill. Uh, Biden is saying there must be a ceasefire. The next day he's saying we have an ironclad commitment to Benjamin Netanyahu and Israel. What What is going on? This is starting to feel like schizophrenia. This is a brilliant question. And to properly answer uh, in such a way that it will be completely understood by your viewers and listeners, we have to go back in history. We have to go back to the practice invented by the previous generation of leftists. I'm talking about the Third Reich. Let's recall what uh, they had in Nazi Germany. They had an organization called SS or Waffen SS, Weapon SS. What was SS? It was military organization, but it was outside the state control. It was not part of the Germany's government. And SS never followed government orders, but it was a military force. 
but this military force was directly subordinated to the party, not to the state. It was reporting to the Nazi party, not to the state. And their chain of command ran in parallel with the Third Reich state authorities. And that private party didn't serve the Reich. It served exclusively Nazi party. And by carrying uh, Nazi ideology, uh, they mimic inside uh, the SS workings of the Nazi party. Uh, not sure if everybody knows, but uh, members of SS called each other comrades. Yeah, the same as the Soviet Union. They call each other comrades. And very often inside the SS, operational decisions were made during Nazi party meetings. And during these meetings, every officer, every sergeant, every private had equal say because they enforced equality among party members. And you cannot be a member of SS without being party member, Nazi party member. So that equal say among party members um, was a source of very big you know, tensions, irritations between standard German army, Wehrmacht, and SS. And this irreconcilable tensions run to the end of the World War II. Well, those are kind of mercenaries or party guided mercenaries existed uh, maybe since biblical times, maybe pre-biblical times. But these mercenaries historically never worshipped any particular ideology. And that ideological component created or rather triggered a lot of followers, a lot of imitations. Other leftists developed the idea. Recent examples are well known. Antifa and Bela in 2020. This is a similar organization. They are not controlled by any state actors. They are organized and controlled by the operatives of the Democrat Party. They promote party ideology. They have strictly ideological goals. And uh, they resemble, historically, brown shirts in uh, Germany, uh, black shirts in uh, fascist Italy. And other modern example, it's in Iran. Iran has a regular army, just like any other country. However, in parallel with regular army, they have revolutionary guards who play the same role as SS units. They report strictly to the party. That's what they do. So, uh, having said that, left decided to make next step. They are very creative people on the left. So the next step was subordinate foreign country to the party rule. Again, not occupy other country and colonize it. No. Colonize other country by using ideology, party forces. Let's say consider Israel. We started from Israel. Before Netanyahu came to power, Israel was a quasi a semi colony of the Democrat Party. Israel was never a colony of the United States as a country, but Democrats always kept Israel on a short leash. Netanyahu, as it's well known, decided to make a shift from left to the right. He decided to decolonize Israel and disengage from the Democrat Party. And what he got? Uh, currently in Israel, uh, they are preparing for another color revolution. And we all know that the American left is very proficient in running these color revolutions. Uh, they already triggered five elections in the last three years in Israel. It's a clear testament that they are doing something against Netanyahu. 
uh, American left, of course, does not want, it does not like losing their colony, Israel, without a fight. And since President Clinton, they try to delegitimize uh, Israel conservatives, remove Netanyahu from office. And after October 7, Hamas attack, Biden administration, after some hesitation, it was some hesitation, but eventually Biden decisively sided with Hamas. I think uh, we have to know that modern Democrats are not capable of of leading a war to a decisive victory. Remember previous wars run by United States after World War II? It looks like ideologically Democrats are not structurally even ready, even conditioned to, to achieve any long-lasting triumph over any other adversary. So they are working hard to prevent everybody in their orbit to, from achieving a uh, uh, total victory against uh, foreign invaders. I think we have to state it clearly that modern Democrats had morphed from Democrats to surrendercrats. And this is what's happening in Israel. They are forcing Israel to surrender. And till present, they keep Israel in iron gloves. And that decolonization process, uh, it just started, never finished. And by doing that, uh, they forced Israel to lose this round against Hamas. And it looks like Israel <clears throat> submitted to Biden's demands. And thanks to Democrats, uh, Hamas almost won. But we have to understand that that's a Pyrrhic victory for Hamas. They will not enjoy long-lasting victory because eventually uh, Israeli left and Israeli right will unite and 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 hit Hamas very hard. And <clears throat> recently, Hamas rejected yet another uh, ceasefire agreement proposed by Biden administration, and Biden eventually decoupled ceasefire and hostage situation from each other so it's a for for the white house it's a two separate issues even though there are six or seven americans still held captive in the tunnels underneath the rafah i think um, another victim of that war is biden himself because now, six months before the November election, he lost Florida. He lost Florida because he he's selling out Israel. And today, early morning, Democrats declared that they are pulling all advertisement funds from, from Florida and moving elsewhere. So for them, Florida is lost, of course. And it returns us back to your original questions. Are they prepare? Ah, are they preparing for the inevitable? Yes, they are trying to prepare and mitigate the risk and minimize the risk. Yeah, I I also read that uh, Ohio alerted the White House and the Democrat National Convention that you you're not going to be on our ballot. Yes. Because your convention is a week after the deadline. And so Ohio, which used to be a purple state and, and went red for Trump, it, it, it may immediately go red for Trump as Biden isn't even on there. So now uh, you have these bellwether states where if if you win those, you typically win the presidency. And, and Trump won those in 2020, but somehow still lost. Uh, that's a whole different discussion, right? But uh, yeah, he, he, they're basically giving up on Florida. They're pulling all their money out of Florida. They may end up losing Ohio. Uh, New Hampshire was also not very good for them. So they're, they're up against a lot. But 
What, why do you think uh, Biden is losing younger voters at such an alarming rate? He's also losing Muslims and the black community and other minority communities. It's the economy is stupid. The phrase everybody knows in America, right? Uh, younger generation was brainwashed at universities and they expected when they graduate, they immediately will be provided, not given, not earned, provided six-figure salaries. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. This generation is so brainwashed. They were not ready for the real life. They are not ready to earn. They are ready to receive. They were promised that everything will be given to them. Money will be taken from these evil Republican billionaires. And, and end of story, beginning of good life. Well, the reality is quite different. And these younger generations happen to be very, very unhappy about it. Some of them had to move back to their parents' basement. Some of them had to work two jobs. And the rosy future they envisioned, or rather, which was planted in their brains, it disappeared. And the younger generation is not, despite the cacophony of the critical theories around them, they are not capable of thinking critically, unfortunately. Okay, so and is... that's why my generation, by the way, who's supposed to retire by now, will never retire. Because the younger generation exists, but they are not contributing to the economy. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, they uh they've been they've been sold this dream and this idea. Uh and it, it's not I, I've seen the TikToks where they're they're in their car, they're crying. They're like I'm working three jobs. I can't barely afford rent. How am I going to afford a house? I can barely buy groceries. I have been lied to. And and, and the government has lied. They, they've tried to lie and say, well, uh, the the inflation is only up by 9%. Yet every, Probably. yeah, the, the 99 cent store is about to close 300 locations and lay off, you know, like 10, 10 or 20,000 workers because it went from the dollar to the dollar fifty store. You can't tell me that it's nine percent. And the government lied to your generation as well because they said, "Oh well, because it's only nine percent, we don't have to give you uh, an affordable increase on your social security." But what they're really saying is, "You guys will bankrupt the nation." And so, what do they do? They lied to both generations, and, and I, I just think it's coming back to bite them in the butt. Uh from the political uh, perspective, the, most more, the, the much more terrible situation is with Washington itself. United States government very soon will not be able to pay interest on the debt accumulated by Democrats, unfortunately. And the, the chain reaction will be very severe because bond traders are much more... Uh, smarter than stock traders, let's say, and they have much more bigger influence on events. And nobody will tolerate that the United States is not capable to pay. That would trigger crisis we never heard because any crisis in the 20th century and 21st century so far was on the backdrop of the stable, United States currency. Now that situation is changing in front of our eyes. And God knows what the consequences will be. And God knows what country will Trump inherit in January 2025. Yeah. Tell me, uh, tell me about this new book you have out, Left Imperialism. What what's it about? What are we going to learn by reading it? Well, uh, if you ask about the book, uh, 
I'm a physicist by trade. I'm a specialist in mathematical physics. And after living decades in the United States, I switched into the political philosophy. So I am physicist turned philosopher. And I continue to approach uh, political philosophy from the mathematical standpoint. What I don't like among all the books and commentators and pundits talking about politics, it's murky terms. As a mathematician, I cannot stand it. I, I just cannot stand how they operate these terms, changing their meanings at will. So today it means one thing, tomorrow it's different thing. Take global warming. Before it became global warming, it was global cooling in 70s. Then it became global warming. Now it's a climate change. In, 20, in 2024, in March, they call it global boiling. Now, what term is right and what term is wrong? Well, <laughs> there are situations where all terms are wrong. But why we have to deal with this situation? Well, in physics, each and every theory has a, let's say, statue of limitations. It has boundaries. For example, theory of gravity talks about astronomical objects, planets, galaxies, but it has nothing to do with quantum mechanics, with electrons and atoms and molecules at all. Vice versa. Quantum mechanics talks about the micro world, small particles, elementary particles, but it says nothing about gravity. There is no bridge between them yet. Physicists are working frantically for over a century to build this bridge, but it's not there. Why it happens? Because contrary to the uh, social studies, social theories, physics never pretends to be absolutely universal theory. Physicists build a model for a phenomena, and there are certain criteria how to build a model. For example, you have to put forth principles, you know, foundational principles, and you should keep this number of principles very small. But based on this small number of foundational principles, you have to predict or describe all known physical phenomena in the field. If, uh, let's say, your theory is about electricity, well, you have to explain all electrical events around you. Uh, but nobody will ask you, if you're a specialist in electricity, to explain gravitational events. It's different model. It's a different branch of physics. Well, it's kind of understandable for everybody who, who graduated the, the, the high school, but political philosophers never consider any limitations. Each political philosopher, especially on the left, considers his theory as the only truth, as universal eternal truth. And all other theories are considered, especially by the left, as unscientific and needs to be discarded. Well, <laughs> when I learned that, uh, I understood it's it's not just just it's silly. It's just, it's a, a ludicrous. It cannot be like that. You cannot build a scientific theory based on murky terms or sh on shifting terms. So I decided to approach political philosophy from the axiomatic point of view. Put first a foundational principle and see what happens next, deriving logical consequences for my theory and see what happens. Maybe I will hit the wall. Maybe I will explain something. Well, <clears throat> how I approach this, um, let me ask you a question. Okay. 
I have to ask you a question just to clarify how I approach this. Do you know if electron existed in the universe before it was discovered in Cavendish Laboratory in 1897? I, I would say that it, it did exist before. Okay, yeah, thank you very much to the right side of politics. Yes, it existed. Another question. Term electron was invented decades before electron was ever invented or discovered, sorry. So what about the term electron? So term electron didn't exist at the beginning of the United States of America. The question is, did electron exist back then? I would say, and I hope did. you answer yes to that question too. <laughs> well, uh, it, it sounds like a simple stuff. However, it creates a proper mindset to make a next step into the politics, and you will see how easy is that. Well, the cornerstone of current political philosophy is a distinction between right and left. And we know that left-right distinction, according to historical records for the first time appeared during French Revolution, where during uh, French Assembly, their parliament, group of people sat on the left from the podium and right from the podium. So going back to the electron question, did left and right wingers exist in human society before the terms were coined at the end of the 18th century. What do you think? I would say they did. Of course they did. And that's my position, that the left-wingers existed and right-wingers existed throughout, throughout human history. Of course, the terms didn't exist back then. They were acting under different names, but the core of the left and right ideologies stayed the same. Terms changed, and we just happened to live in the 21st century, let's say uh, uh, 250 years after these terms got discovered, applied, and commonly accepted. So we just live in the era where left and right uh, got commonly accepted, but they existed forever, let's say, okay? Uh, most likely they existed uh, during cave age, when people lived like tribes in, in a cave, you know, uh, millions of years ago. So, once we said that, we cannot proceed without defining who they are, left and right. Otherwise, we will repeat the same ideological fallacies as many others, when they talk about left and right without telling who they are. It would be very misleading. So I had to apply a proper definition of the left and right in such a way that it would be valid not only during those 250 years since their inception, but before that and hopefully after that. See the problem? It's a monumental problem. And in order to find the definition, I did the following. I took a piece of paper, divided in two halves. And on the left-hand side, I wrote all known to me characteristics of the left. And on the right-hand side, all known to me characteristics of the right. And what do you mean characteristics? All those common isms apply to them. Let's say populism would be left and right. Anti-Semitism would be left and right. Nationalism would be left and right. Isolationism, left and right. So I compile that list and I start going through that list, eliminating similar entries because if they are in both sides, they could not be used to distinguish between them, right? Mm, okay. 
Yeah, obviously. If if let's say uh, uh, left patriotism exists and right patriotism exists, so patriotism cannot be used to tell who is who, okay. left or right. So I uh, start running through that list, and somewhere in the middle, I almost went to the panic mode because uh, because so many things are in common between left and right. So I thought maybe it's a dead end. Maybe all their characteristics are the same. Well, at the end of the list, one characteristic stood out, which was not shared between left and right. And I call it individual left paradigm. An entire book is based on that individual Men, individual state paradigm, which describes interaction between men and state. This is the major thing I uncovered. And instead of compiling a list of many foundational principles, I decided to use single foundational principle and see how deep the rabbit hole goes. And I was able, as in physical theory, derived a lot of stuff from a single foundational principle. In the book, I uh, consider many well-known historical events from that new perspective. American Civil War, World War I, World War II, Spanish Civil War, you know, all other events, revolutions, French Revolution, American Revolution, many events from that new perspective. And that new perspective, it looks like, is very beneficial. Why? Let's recall what Copernicus did. Do you know what Copernicus did? Uh, I think so, but remind me. <laughs> okay. People back then knew that there are two types of objects in the sky. One, they call stars. They move only in one direction. Every night you look at the star, it looks in the, it, it moves in the right, in one direction. And the other objects in the sky, well, it was well before satellites, of course. These objects made like this, S, move. So they move back and forth and then return back to their past. And it was impossible for people back then to rationally explain it. There are many models like Ptolemy astronomy model, but it was not precise. What Copernicus did, he said, wait a sec, wait a sec. These movements, these complex movements are not complex at all. Let's move frame of reference instead of the earth into the sun voila from the sun's point of view all planets and all stars move in one direction everything nice and easy and the very first calculations by copernicus were order of magnitude more precise than anything before him so what he actually did he shifted frame of reference what I am doing in my book, I am analyzing politics from different perspectives, from the different set of principles, from the different frame of reference. And within that frame of reference, all political movements immediately occupy simple, very understandable position. And that's why I, I always tell everybody who is interested that my book, Left Imperialism, it's not actually a book. Well, it's a it's a physical book or a book in an electronic format, but it's a it's a journey through the labyrinth of all ideologies. And application of that new frame of reference makes that analysis very easy. Very easy. Uh, I also challenge the notion that political ideologies are written in stone. No. They are evolving, and their evolution is very similar to biological evolution. But uh, the, 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 the core selling point, if you will, 
of the book is not philosophy. Being a physicist, I offer ideological x-ray machine, which allows everybody who reads the book use this x-ray machine to screen everybody, every politician, every friend, every government action from that new ideological paradigm. And this tool allows very simple navigation through the landscape of all these ideologies. It immediately answers the questions, who are the anarchists, left or right wing? It immediately answers the questions, who were the Nazis, left or right wing? Who were the fascists, left or right wing? You find answer to these questions in so precise, almost mathematical precision, you will be quite surprised. Wow. Well, the, the, the book is great and it's getting incredible reviews online. Uh, I know you go through many different uh, world leaders and expose them based off of this model and, and this paradigm. Um, so I appreciate you, you writing that. I'm going to leave a link to the book down below so that people can just go right to it and, and learn more about it and buy it if they'd like. Um, and I want to thank you for coming on and uh, helping give some perspective to uh, these ma major news stories. Uh, Dr. Gindler, if people want to follow you online, where, where can I direct them? Where could I point them towards? I'm on Twitter X, Gary underscore US, or you can find me by name, Gary Gindler. You can uh, check uh, my uh, website, GaryGindler.com. Okay. I will make sure to put that down below so people can get right to you. Thank you so much for coming on. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Stephen, for inviting me. Nice to be with you.